Good afternoon and welcome to this evidence session for the Independent Committee on Standards in Public Life. Uh, the committee advises the Prime Minister and the government of the day on processes and systems to uphold high ethical standards across British public life. Uh, on the 25th anniversary of our committee, which was in 2019, we commissioned some academic work to look at the, the tapestry of standard structures that have grown up in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, and particularly to identify any areas where there were gaps or overlaps. And in following up from that, and in the course of, for this inquiry, we have uh, been looking at areas where the system is working well, areas where it might not be working as well as it might. And we're intending then to come forward with recommendations for improvement and hopefully examples of best practice uh, so as to uh, be able to put those to the government later this year. Uh, I'm very pleased that for this session we have with us then Carolyn Fairbairn, the former uh, Chief Executive of the um, Confederation of British Industry, the CBI, and also Sir Jonathan Simons, who has had a distinguished business career, but is currently the chairman of GSK, the pharmaceuticals company. From the committee side, we have a mixture of our independent members, uh, including uh, Dr. Jane Martin, Monisha Shah, Dame Shirley Pierce, and political members, including uh, Dame Margaret Beckett and Jeremy Wright, MP, uh, representing the Labour and Conservative parties, respectively. Um, this is a live stream event through our YouTube channel. For those who are less familiar with the committee's work, just to point out that we will not be touching on specific cases, uh, and we are particularly avoiding anything uh, that is currently in front of the courts. Uh, we are focusing particularly on systems and best practice uh, in the evidence that we are taking. So I think without more ado, I can uh, start uh, by asking perhaps uh, Dame Caroline and then Sir Jonathan, uh, what, how would you see ethical standards? How would you define ethical standards in a business uh, context? Because business ethics seems to be quite a lively area in recent years. Uh, well, well, yes, just to uh, say again how delighted I am to be here, Lord Evans, and to be uh, addressing your uh, committee, because this is such an incredibly important subject, uh, the subject of business ethics. And as you say, uh, very live within the business community, and I think particularly uh, live through the pandemic. Um, I think it has shone a light on the value that business can contribute, um, but also the challenges of, of the environment uh, that it operates in. Um, and in terms of the definition of business, uh, of ethics in a business world, um, I, I do think that the Nolan principles actually have tremendous resonance. Uh, and I refreshed my memory of them. Uh, I was a member of your committee uh, a, a while ago. Uh, and as I thought about the read across, I thought four in particular were particularly resonant for the business environment. But there are some differences, which perhaps I could also uh, attempt to bring out. Um, I think the value of integrity uh, that value of, um, of uh, being um, uh, not acting in your own self-interest, absolutely central to, uh, to the business world and to business leadership. Um, openness and transparency has been growing in importance. I think particularly in a social media world where actually if you are, um, if you are not transparent, there is, a, um, there is um, a, a spotlight being shone on your business uh, that will uh, make it so in a way that is uncomfortable for you. Uh, honesty, speaking truth at all times, um, and personal leadership. Those four, I think, um, in my experience, are hugely resonant in the business world. I do, however, think that there are two that I see as very much part of the business ethics framework that are not, I think, necessarily captured in the Nolan principles. Um, and the first I think is a, uh, is, is a set of ethics that are around fairness and empathy. And I think it's quite interesting. I think it's probably um, a, a set of principles that have emerged as being absolutely central in the public environment as well. That sense of being non-discriminatory, that sense of valuing every individual in your workforce uh, equally and dealing with them in an empathetic way, I think has that risen up uh, the Richter scale of uh, the ethics, ethical values against which business leaders are judged um, and the importance to which many businesses ascribe to them. 
Uh, and then I think the final um, sort of uh, uh, adjustment I would make, I think, around the Nolan principles for a business world are around this concept of selflessness. And I know that you have given plenty of thought to this um, in the committee itself. But there is absolutely an ethic around the delivery of public purpose that I see increasingly uh, 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 resonant uh, in the business world. I talk about it all the time with CBI members. What is your public purpose? How do you deliver that? How are you seen to deliver that? Um, and I do think it is different from selflessness. When I reread the definition uh, in the Nolan Principles, which said acting solely in the public interest, I think that is a difficult ethic to apply to, uh, to a commercial environment. But this concept of being purpose-driven, um, I think is running like a stick of rock through uh, many businesses now. Um, and I think is something against which they are um, increasingly judged and increasingly holding themselves to a very high standard. Thank you. John Simons? Well, let me um, build on what then Carolyn has just said. I mean, I think in many ways, uh, the values or the code of conscience are largely enduring principles, but the context changes. And I think they then have to be reinterpreted or adapted uh, to those circumstances. And I think as Karen has just said, I think we are in one of, I guess even for my, my lifetime in business, one of these really major shifts uh, in context. And it's caused by two things. One, uh, the increasing relevance of the ESG agenda. And I think, you know, there's been a lot done on G. I think the sustainability and E. But I think COVID has really emphasized the S, you, you know, the social purpose and your contribution to society. So I think there is quite a big evolutionary shift to reinterpret. And I don't think, and I don't expect that the values and expectations that we have at GSK will change at all, but how we apply them. And um, I think that there is this, you use the word um, processes and systems. And in some senses, you know, the process and system which they sit in is organic, as I've just tried to explain, but they have got to be connected. So we connect really three things. One is, what is our purpose? And never, just to really emphasize what Carolyn just said, never has it been more important for business to articulate its purpose to all stakeholders, but in particular, uh, employees how that's translated into strategic priorities. But the underpin in that is the values and expectations. And I have no, I have no disagreement with the seven points you have here because they are enduring. You know, ours are different. You know, first value is patient focus at all times to act in the interests of the patient that we ultimately serve transparency, respect for individual, the whole uh, diversity and inclusion agenda, integrity, and then expectations. We expect people to act with courage, to be accountable, to develop themselves and develop their team and to work with teams. So I think, you know, they're different, but they're the same. And I think that they do have to be justified um, in relation to the business purpose and the context in which you're operating. But it is, but as I say, it is also organic. And I think we're in one of those seismic periods of change right now. Why, why is business talking about purpose as much as it is in recent years? What's, what's changed either within the environment or within the business that means that this discussion on purpose rather than on shareholder value has become so dominant? Well, I think... Uh Sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead, John, go ahead. Well, I think it, it's, it has always been there. And, um, you know, if I use the case of, of GSK, we have a purpose statement and then we have a series of priorities that people do every single day. So innovation, perform, build trust with our stakeholders. And then there was this 
purpose, which was seen as something that was something a bit more altruistic and something separate. What COVID has really done, in a way I don't think I ever would have expected, has fused this together, you know, because we've had to ask people to commit in ways that they never expected before. And they've committed because they can see now that you have to innovate, you have to perform in order to deliver a purpose. We've had people, you know, the epicenter of, of coronavirus was, in, um, was near Milan. Our biggest European manufacturing plant is in Milan, in the center of coronavirus. We didn't lose a single hour of production because people knew that they were working to deliver life-saving medicines. You know, so it was this connection. So I think it's always been there, but I think now the reflection of, you know, so what do you do, how do you do it, and who benefits, I think is, is much clearer than it's ever been. And can I perhaps build on, on what Jonathan has just said there and, and, and add that I, I, I think there has also been um, a, a, and I will call it this, there was a crisis of trust in business yes. that I, I think followed the financial crash. Um, it was born of, I think, a growing recognition um, uh, amongst ordinary people that a shareholder driven, a purely shareholder driven uh, business environment wasn't necessarily delivering fairness. It wasn't necessarily delivering what we wanted to see in terms of climate. It wasn't necessarily delivering the outcomes that we all wanted. Um, and you saw that in trust measures um, of business over time. The, the Edelman Trust Survey, I think has been widely quoted already to you. Um, and it did show that from 2008 onwards, there was a very marked decline in trust in business. And that actually affected businesses license to operate. You cannot work and deliver and serve customers well in an environment where trust is broken down. Uh, and um, so I thought, I think you saw many businesses and many business leaders come back to basics on how you rebuild trust. And um, a lot of that was about coming back to what you were there for that went beyond pure shareholder returns and public purpose. And as Jonathan says, it's always been there, but I think it's been brought into sharp focus by some of the challenges to the economic model we have around the unfairness and the inequalities that it's generating. Um, and the, the, the thing I think that is very encouraging to see is that business leaders have really stepped up on this. Uh, and um, the most recent data on trust shows that business trust has actually turned a corner and it's been rising. Uh, and actually business is the most trusted of the four institutions now that uh, the Edelman Trust Survey measures. And indeed the CBI, uh, where, where I spent the last five years, we developed our own trust survey of business and that has also shown an increase in the UK. Um, and interestingly, over the course of the last year through COVID, business has been seen to step up and act in their public interest, uh, you know, making hand sanitizers and ventilators and, uh, as, and delivering food to NHS uh, workers uh, and so on. So I think it's a complex set of reasons, but um, together they're now coming uh, to, 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 to put public purpose, I think, absolutely at the forefront of many business uh, uh, agendas. My, my last question on this section, but at a practical level, how would you go about inculcating an ethical culture within a business? So um, I, I think there's been quite a, a sea change in, in the approaches taken actually in the last few years. So I think that there are three ways in which um, businesses seek to inculcate this kind of uh, the, the, uh, you know, an ethical environment. Um, one is government and process. The second is around culture. And the third is around incentives. Uh, and I think the balance between those has changed. When, if I go back 10 years, I would say process, governance and incentives were the major route to inculcating uh, a set of um, um, ethical principles within an organisation. Culture has absolutely come to the fore. So governance still matters uh, hugely, the role of a board, the role of risk committees, of audit committees. Um, I've just joined a board where they have a 250 page operating framework, which sets down all of the rules for um, all of the contracting that it does. These are important. Um, uh, the uh, regulation is important, anti-bribery, anti anti-corruption. 
Um, and similarly, the incentives within that. I think we know that um, some of the most serious scandals of recent years uh, in business, take the PPI scandal in banking, it was largely the result of incentives that were set up within the organization that encouraged people uh, at, at the grassroots level to sell products that weren't the right products because that's how the incentives were set up. And so I think there's been a lot of focus on uh, transforming uh, incentives and making them more uh, aligned to, uh, to higher ethical values. But I do think this point about culture and how you, how you create a culture where people instinctively know the right decision to take is actually where the action is uh, and where so many businesses are putting their time. Induction programs where you really consider the hard cases because often there are trade-offs uh, involved. Um, having a set of values um, uh, that are uh, unique to the organization. Most companies, most members of the CBI uh, now have those. Having a public purpose, public purpose that is really well understood by employees. So if you scratch an employee, they can tell you what it is um, and are proud of it. Um, I, I think you are seeing more and more emphasis on cultural engagement uh, with, with, with ethical values. And that's where leadership plays such an important part. Um, the, the role modeling um, of, um, uh, of leaders within an organization who set the culture. So although it's still those three elements, I think they have changed. Uh, they changed order over the last few years with culture being uh, now the most important. I just have a couple of things to perhaps add to that. One, I think just coming back to what Carolyn said on, uh, on incentives, there is now a very clear separation on all performance measures and, and evaluations on what targets have you set? So what did you, what did you do? But equally important, how did you do it? What standards, what behaviors, and, and, and how did you achieve your results? And they are just as important now as your hard targets. So the, the incentive piece, I think, has taken time to follow. But it's an important check on, you know, the naked pursuit of profit or the delivery of something at the expense of other things. I think the other thing that is really important is that, you know, in any large community, GSK is 100,000, 100,000 people. Um, you know, bad things will happen. And um, so you have got to have checks and balances to be able to make sure you're capturing, you know, where the culture uh, is, is shifting. You know, it could be poor leadership. It could be a, you know, where, where some activity is out of line with uh, the culture. But I think this process of, of seeking out, you know, where problems may occur through cult, through surveys or audit, culture audits or behavior audits uh, or risk assessments it is it is so important and um, you know and I think ultimately that's what reinforces the um, the culture when people see that you are actually seeking to make sure that it that it operates as you want it to do thank you I'm going to hand over to Dr Jane Martin um, thank you, Jonathan, and good afternoon, Dame Caroline and, and Sir Jonathan. Um, I'd, uh, obviously, our review is looking uh, primarily at the focus on government, of course, but we're very keen to learn from business and your experiences. And, um, and Dame Caroline, you've already uh, accentuated the importance of leadership, personal leadership, and you both talked about that. Um, but I'd like to uh, ask you to just sort of... Uh, let's dive a bit more into the whole issue of leadership I mean, from the top of an organization, but also distributed across an organization. Uh, uh, you know, how, what does good leadership look, already said that you believe it's very important. Um, and, you know, really sort of practical examples perhaps of wh where you've seen things work uh, very well when leaders uh, do help to uh, support and generate a, a high standards uh, ethical culture. Uh, so it's such an it's a good afternoon. It's such it's such an important question, uh, and um, again, I think that good leadership is changing uh, in response to these challenges of, 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 of ethical behaviour. Um, 
good leadership increasingly, uh, I think, is about how you listen and how you respond to what you hear. And I think that is particularly important um, it, when you're considering uh, uh, ethical, ethical behavior. If I give you some really con concrete examples. Um, yes, it's very important for as a leader to, to role model um, in the moment, um, good decision making. But I think equally important is what happens when something has been brought to your attention that isn't working properly in your organization. How do you respond to that? How do you listen to it? How much respect do you show to the people who have brought those issues to your attention? And how transparent are you in how you resolve those issues? I think has become absolutely central. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a principle that um, uh, I, I, I was taught in, in one of my uh, very first roles, which was the obligation to dissent. Um, and there is something I think in very uh, uh, um, successful high ethics organizations, the obligation to dissent is felt quite keenly throughout the organization. But what does a leader do when there is dissent? Mm -hmm. And actually there was a very sharp edged example of this last year uh, around Black Lives Matter. Um, that wouldn't normally, I think, be considered to be an issue of ethics, but it became an issue of values and ethics um, because I saw business leaders all across the UK being challenged by their employees about the ethical standards that they had in their organisations around race. And the good leaders, and I watched them in action, the good leaders listened to those concerns, which were often coming from their young employees who were concerned about discrimination in the workplace and the good leaders listened they got groups of people together they tried to understand the behaviors that were happening in the organization that were giving rise to the extreme distress uh, that lay behind the black lives matter movement and they worked through a solution with their employees and i think that's a new kind of listening leadership that we are increasingly seeing and I think you can, I've seen that applied in cases of bullying. I've seen it, in, I've seen it um, applied in cases of low level corruption, where there has been attempts to bribe, where that has been raised up a chain. And how you react to that as a leader and how much respect you show to people, no matter how junior they are in the organization, when they do bring something to your attention, I think is incredibly uh, important. Uh, and um, it's an aspect of leadership which I think is sometimes overlooked, the ability to listen um, and to act on what you hear. Thank you. Um, Sir Jonathan. Yeah, I think, um, you know, leadership has always been um, viewed as an exercise of top down. You know, here's the strategy, here's what we expect you know, here's the measurements and here's how we're performing. Actually, what I think is remarkable about the time now is that actually there's a very high element of bottom up. Mm -hmm. You know, with the new generation of people coming in, you know, who are really interested in leadership, its authenticity. Um, does it do what it says? You know, do we live the words that are on that are on the statement. And there's sort of, there's, there is a feeling of a, you know, a very big mirror that's being held up now. And, you know, just to pick on the example of um, Black, Lives, Black Lives Matter, and we've just recently introduced um, an updated inclusion and diversity policy with new targets. You know, I and a fellow board member went around the employee, the, the the diversity employee groups, it was very, very uncomfortable. These were people that was, there was, I mean, they were obviously, you know, recognizing they were dealing with the chairman, but this was a serious question. How are you doing this? What is, what do you plan to do? How will you respond? How will you measure it? How will you hold management to account? And so I think that there is a, there is something of an inversion going on. And I think the traditional style of leadership has to be much more open, transparent, inclusive. And it has to, you know, because talent now, they won't stay if they don't believe it. And so it's, a, you know, the obligations are much, feel much higher um, today than they did, you know, a decade, a decade ago. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that, that's all from me. Uh, I think Manisha Shah has now got some questions. Thank you. Thank you and good afternoon. Um, hello. Hello. Okay. I had some questions around the importance of high public standards in the business environment. And you, you, you talked about um, uh, within a business uh, uh, and, 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 what, and culture, etc., which is really fascinating. Um, what, uh, perhaps, uh, Dame Caroline first, what do you feel is the relationship between public standards and business confidence? I mean, and, and, and I suppose the, 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 the connected question would be, do you think that high public standards make the UK a more attractive place to invest in? Um, incontrovertibly, yes. It, 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 it's been very interesting in my previous role, um, I, I was fortunate enough to visit um, many countries and I was a representative of British business. And so I got a pretty frank assessment of the UK environment from the outside in. And I lost count of the number of times um, the, uh, the UK was cited as being an attractive place to invest because of the rule of law, its predictability and its high public standards. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, and very, and interestingly, uh, the, the World Bank's ease of doing business survey uh, has we are now number eight, having been number nine, we've risen up that survey, and that very much takes into account the uh, the, the stand, public standards within that uh, survey. And it, it is incontrovertible to me that one of our calling cards globally um, is is this sort of set of standards to which we hold ourselves, both in public life and in corporate life, actually. And I think they are seen uh, to be uh, hand to to go hand in hand, and that there are many countries who are seeking to emulate us. I mean, I was in India uh, the, year before, uh, the year before I left, and it was very clear to me that uh, the, many of the Modi reforms were very much intended to emulate uh, the, the, the high standards to which the UK uh, holds itself. So we need to protect it um, uh, very carefully uh, in, in these coming years. Thank yes, you. Yes, just, just to build on that, um, if I may, um, you know, I think that, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I mentioned, um, you know, our three strategic priorities are innovation, performance and trust. And the trust piece is a significant uh, criteria to investment. Um, and where we believe that we cannot operate without potentially breaching trust or our reputation, then we don't. Um, I think it's fairly well known that um, you know, GSK had had some problems in China. Our entire investment strategy in China now is depending on can we grow with acceptable, with acceptable risk. And, and I think that that is true across many countries now. So, um, you know, and if you're if you're the recipient of a de decreasing amount of investment, then I think you know you need to learn that you know you don't have the business environment that is that is conducive to attracting investment because you, you know all of us now operate under such scrutiny that we can't afford to have it. So we had a problem, have a problem. So I think you know this is perhaps in times past and you know this was less explicit but I think it is now you know the risk and trust agenda is now explicit in all investment investment decisions thank you but it, 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 it very fast very uh, interesting answers I mean I, I suppose the, the question is do you uh, do you think and 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 if so what are the particular patterns of political behavior? that you might say act as warning signs uh, for businesses not to invest in the context of standards and ethics? Um, sh shall I, shall I uh, have, have, a, have a crack at that? So um, uh, I think that there are uh, a number of things that I have heard mentioned to me by, by international investors around their, 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 the, political, the political judgments they take. Predictability of decision-making um, absolutely uh, fundamental. 
whether you put that in, in the realm of ethics, I don't know, but um, uh, decisions that are predictable, that are governed by the rule of law, and that you can count on, I think would be one. Um, I think the second would be low levels of corruption. So I think that that sense of faith that uh, individuals were acting uh, with integrity, um, because I think that again, just speaks to the safety of your investment. Um, uh, and, and I think the third thing is, there is something about the political institutions and their resilience and, re and their robustness. And I think what we know is that over the last two or three years, we've seen many global institutions um, really put under strain. Uh, in the US for sure, in our own country through the Brexit process, um, but in many countries, I think that the uh, challenges of um, this sort of post-crisis world and the challenges of populism um, have created political turbulence in many countries. And so I, I, I do think that um, some kind of instinctive feel that investors have about the institutional resilience, the, 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 the courts, the parliaments, the, um, the separation of executive uh, and, uh, and, and legislature, you know, those kind of issues, I think have become uh, more uh, important. Um, and, you know, and I do think there have been some challenges there for the UK during that period. I think that they are reflected in the Moody's evaluation. I hope that we're through those now. I mean, the, 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 the issues that were cited most to me um, over my time at the CBI as affecting the UK as a business environment politically were the deadlock over Brexit, the fact that it took a very long time. So purely passage of time, they, they, you know, John Burko became famous um, because he was uh, so often presiding over a deadlocked vote. Um, and I think secondly, there were some challenging moments, shall I say, just in terms of, for example, the proroguing of parliament last year, that was raised with me. Um, the, um, the, the, the possibility that international law might have been broken. Uh, it wasn't, thankfully. Um, but that was raised with me in the context of trade deals. Um, but I do think that these are have to be put in the context of, I go back to this point about the UK is very, very highly regarded overall. It will take a long time, I think, uh, to dent that. Um, we are still number eight in the world for ease of doing business. Uh, so I think these were local difficulties, if you were, if you like, that we can overcome. Um, but I think what happens over the next two or three years will be absolutely vital in terms of predictability, low levels of co corruption um, and um, effective functioning of our main institutions. Thank you. So, Jonathan. Yeah, perhaps just, um, I mean, I think the point that Carolyn has just made about um, the reputation of the UK, uh, I think is, is very is very powerful and, and you know in our business it's actually very easy to say well look we can't do business in Africa you know because you know the the warning signals are too high or parts of Asia or countries where you know but our business you know our our objective is to improve global human health so we can't we can't walk away from um from these markets. And that's why I think, you know, the UK role in trying to support countries to improve their program of governance. I mean, and you've seen, you've seen how important it has been in the current pandemic, the role of COVAX and CEPI and the World Health, Health Organization as the vehicle to deliver because we don't really feel that we have an option of saying, well, look, you know, our pediatric vaccines are fantastic, but we can't afford to let them in those parts of the world. So we actually have to make sure that our products get into markets that don't meet our normal risk criteria. And we have to find a way through collaboration or global institutions to make them available. So, you know, this isn't something the UK can back away from and saying, well, look, we're fine. I think you know we really have to use the, the the reputation that we have as a as a standard for other people to um, you know want to achieve. Thank you. So one last question from me, uh, then Carolyn. You talked about Moody's and referenced its uh, downgrading of the UK's credit rating. Um, 
you know, it, it said, I think, that the quality of the UK's leg legislative and executive decision making or institutions have dim has diminished over the years. And I wondered whether you had view on whether UK businesses feel or, or, or um, have a reaction to the pressure, the political pressure on public standards within the UK. For example, um, there's been a lot of press on political pressure on the appointments process, for example, for a number of regulators and public bodies. Is that something that you think concerns businesses? Um, I think I think insofar as uh, it is, it becomes part of the 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 UK brand. It it starts affecting the UK brand. Yes, it does. You know, our ability to attract foreign direct investment has been one of the UK's greatest strengths over the last three decades. You know, we are still number one in Europe in terms of the attraction of international investment. And, um, you know, as Modi as Moody is recognizing uh, the, 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 the challenge to our, our, our institutions um, is part of that. Um, I, I, I think the Moody's has been responding to a particularly challenging time in the UK political environment through Brexit. Um, and, um, and I think that did put our institutions under tremendous pressure. Um, the houses, um, but also uh, the, the clash with the legal, um, with, the, with, with, with the justice system was very, very public. And of course, you know, going back to the world of global media, it was broadcast all, and it was, it was good television. That was the other thing. And so I think, unfortunately, our brand did take a temporary knock. Um, but I think, as I say, I think it's entirely overcomable because of the strength that we have in that. In terms of the public appointment system, um, it is not something I've heard mentioned, actually, in terms of the public pressure on, um, on our regulators. Um, I think we have, um, actually, I have had cited to me the quality of our regulators, um, by, um, certainly by international investors. We are seen as having very good uh, independent economic regulation, um, uh, uh, in, in you know, our financial regulation, if anything, a little bit too on onerous from time to time, but um, it doesn't, it has never been cited to me as being subject to political pressure or corruption. I think that there are interestingly some challenges around our local political uh, structures. And I would take the opportunity, if I may, just to mention the LEPs, which are um, a really important part of the fabric of engagement between local politicians and local government and the business environment. And that is a patchy world where there is sometimes lack of transparency over appointments, not enough real business uh, experience around the table. Um, and so funnily enough, you know, if I was going to make a point to you about where I've heard business voices uncomfortable about standards, um, uh, affecting investment, it would more be at the local LEP level where they do feel that that isn't working well in all, in all cases than internationally. Thank you. Sir so Jonathan. Yeah, I think it, it, it does matter. And I think one has got to get yourself into the position of actually where you see outside commentary as healthy. Um, the number of people that comment and observe on our business, you, you know, whether it's investors, action groups, employees. I mean, I think that what you have, it's part of, it's part of being accountable. You, you know, you have to accept that, you know, sometimes it's critical and sometimes it's unfair, but actually you've got to, you've got to think about what you're hearing. I mean, that is one of, the roles I have as a chair of GSK is, you know, absorb all the views from outside and try and piece the picture up. And is it the same as the one we have? And if it's not, you know, who's, who's right, who's wrong, who needs to adjust? And so actually I think, you know, we should encourage commentary so long as it's sort of done in the right way as a, as a healthy piece of, um, you know, it's the world we live in and it's part of being accountable. And so I think, you know, hiding from it, you know, is not, um, you know, is not, is not a good thing. I would also endorse um, 
what Caroline has just said about our regulators. You, you know, I think sometimes when you're in the middle of it, you, you know, it's it's quite it's quite demanding. But I think you know our principle-based approach to regulation. I mean, I think the MHRA has done a superb job. You know, through the whole, you know, it's been it it's acted responsibly, it's been fast, it's been science-based. And I think, um, you know, it's one of the areas where I think we have, um, our institutions are a model for many parts of the world. Thank you, Chair, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Shirley Pierce, who is on mute. Thank you very much. <laughs> Dame Carolyn, Sir Jonathan, um, if we could move um, um, away from the public standards to the standards in businesses, back to, back to, to, to that. I'm uh, interested in your perception of the relationship between ethical standards and overall business success. I mean, there's been, I think it's deeply impressive how um, the, the business sector has engaged the ESG agenda and making that core. Um, but I'm keen to get a sense of how much is that a nice to have uh, and how much is it core to business success in hard commercial terms in the future? Um, really great question. Uh, and um, I think uh, increasingly absolutely central, although we mustn't be Pollyanna-ish about it. You know, there are going to be areas of, 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 of conflict and contradiction, particularly on the uh, on the on the climate agenda, I think as we as we go forward. But if I can give you the hard edged reasons why um, ESG ethical standards really matter for business form performance, I would split them into three. And you know, I think we see these very practically. Um, the first is absolutely around talent, and Jonathan mentioned this. You know, you um, employees want to feel proud of the organisation they work for. And they will move. You know, talent is mobile. People are mobile, uh, and they will leave an organisation where they do not feel that they uh, that, that that they see the standards um, and the public purpose that they want to. And we know this to be true. I mean, just one uh, one one small example. We know that two thirds of women now look at the gender pay gap of a company that they are thinking of joining before they answer a job advert. You know, so. Um, that is just, it, it's, it, whether you call that an ethical standard, I do, going back to fairness, uh, uh, I, I think that tells you uh, a lot. Um, and pretty well every employee survey you come across now has pride in your company as being one of the most important metrics that leadership look at to know whether they are doing a good job. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's the war for talent. So that's reason number one. If you want the best people, you have to live up to these uh, standards. Um, the second reason is consumer brand. We know that the Twitter sphere, we know that social media exposes, you know, Primark um, around child labor, um, or uh, look at, um, look at how, how public some of the issues have been uh, around McKinsey recently. Um, that, you know, the, the media is now highly targeted, ubiquitous, um, very detailed, very challenging, and very personal. So consumer brand is the second reason why this uh, matters. Um, and the third reason is, and I mentioned this before, it's about your ability to succeed and your license to operate as a business if you don't hold these standards uh, high. And I think the financial services industry uh, is uh, a case in point because they suffered so, so much after the crash. Actually, their ability to influence regulation and have a voice at that table was much diminished. Um, and these are three really strong reasons that set apart, if you like, from the, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. These are three hard edged business commercial reasons why I think you see uh, so many businesses now uh, particularly focused uh, on this. And I think um, uh, Jonathan's already touched on it. The climate agenda, I think is going to be genuinely challenging. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was incredibly encouraged that when I, um, I, I, I wanted to write to the, to the prime minister, to Theresa May at the time to, um, to, to gather business support for a 2050 net zero target. And I thought I was going to struggle. I thought I was going to have a few stragglers who might sign up. And actually I had hundreds of CBI members mm. who signed that letter and were absolutely instrumental in uh, the prime minister agreeing to that legislated uh, target. 
Um, and that tells you a lot. I, mean, I think that tells you that for all those reasons, for talent, for brand and for license to operate, that climate target is now real. It features in the public purpose of a large number of FTSE 100 companies. Uh, and, and I think that we can really uh, run with that. Um, I think we have to be honest um, and say, this isn't going to be true for every single company um, all the time. And that is going to be the challenge uh, of regulation to ensure that you align as many businesses as possible with, um, with you know, these three reasons to, uh, to do the right thing. But I do think that there is a very commercial, um, compelling commercial reason behind observing high ethical standards for those three reasons. Thank you. Mr. Jonathan. Yes, well, let me make a come at this. I, I agree with everything that Caroline has just said, but I, let me just sort of make a different point. And that is, um, you know, I think we all believe that to be true, um, but it needs to be continuously tested and measured. And I think that I have been surprised on many occasions where what I believe to be true about our culture and our behavior was not always matched by, you know, what people thought. And so you really have to search out where the inconsistencies are. And I'll give you the example that Carolyn mentioned that the um, after the, the financial crisis, the reputation of the financial services industry to do the right thing for its customers was questioned, rightly so. And the Banking Standards Board implemented um, a set of cultural surveys and questions and they introduced them into all of the banks. And they were on common questions. And so not only you could see how you were being evaluated, and these were, in the case of HSBC, it was like 20,000 people who had, had been part of this survey. And I remember seeing him was completely shocked by, you know, the disparities of things that we believed, you know, on, on some fairly fundamental things about, are you confident to speak up? Do you believe that if you speak up, your first line manager will support you? Do you trust the leadership? I mean, these were, these were fundamental questions. And actually for the three years after this, we built our entire business strategy around improving those mm -hmm. those cultural behavioral metrics because if we because they were central to the success of the success of the business mm -hmm. and so you know you cannot at any point in time you know be complacent about this you've got to constantly constantly be measuring it and I and I and I really commend the work that the Banking Standards Board has done it's been an outstanding piece of work and has and has genuinely led to uh, improved standards right across the financial services industry and is now being implemented in most other countries around the world using precisely the same model. That's really interesting thank you. Are there ever, perhaps carrying on with you Jonathan for a moment but are there ever times um, when there's um, a trade-off really between business efficiency and the ethical standards um, in times of crisis or desire to innovate and find quick solutions? Are, are you seeing tensions emerge? I think there is most definitely um, speed, agility, um, the pace of decision making is definitely changing and and also the um, the adaptability of the business model of moving from a, you know a, a bricks and mortar business to a digital based business there's been some there's been some dramatic changes i think it comes back to the quality and openness and transparency of uh, of leadership and the why, and going back to the things that we've been talking about. Why is this the right thing to do? How does it fit with our purpose? You know, how do we adjust um, our measures? What do we want people to do? And I have also been very surprised by, you know, I've got a leadership team here who haven't, you know, haven't visited a country for a year. Their visibility has gone through the roof. They're way more visible now than they've ever been. Yeah. And um, 
you know, it really does make you, it really does make you think, but it has to be led. Yes. And, and, and you have to also accept that not everybody will agree that you've made the right trade off and let them question it. Yeah. I think, um, you know, this is what I think, you know, going back to what we were both saying at the very beginning about the, the values of, you know, integrity, respect, transparency, you have to live them. Mm. Then, Carolyn, do you, do you have advice about this ten potential tension in some settings between speed? Yes, and I, 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 I agree that I, I think that there, that the pace at which uh, things are moving at the moment is putting strain uh, on, uh, on, 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 on judgments. Uh, and I just couldn't agree more strongly with Jonathan, though, that I think that the that the solution to that is to be listening to concerns, because the people who know when corners are being cut in the wrong way or decisions are being taken that are actually not in line with the values of the organisation are your employees on the ground. Mm. Uh, and actually, um, I saw this in my last few months at the CBI, um, the organisations that were listening to their employees who said, actually, it's really hard working from home. Actually, this is creating new challenges. Actually, I'm not able to properly um, review this contract because I haven't got all the evidence because I'm not on site. They were the successful businesses because they were, uh, they, they were listening to the concerns that um, employees had. Uh, so um, I, I think it's, if anything, it's, 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 it's increased the importance of that engagement that Jonathan and I have both uh, been talking about. So I uh, guess I think you are right to be alive to the tensions that pace of this change is always going to create. Um, and, and it's about listening to concerns in your organization. Thank you both. I'll, I'll hand on to Margaret Beckett. Thank you. That's been extremely interesting, and you've both spoken um, about the pace of change. Um, Jonathan, you spoke about adaptability and uh, agility. So are there things the public sector can learn from the private sector now when it comes to ethical standards? I, I think going back to the very... Um, the very beginning and the and the seven principles you have you know they ha they are enduring but i mean i would i would strongly urge you to continuously measure um and assess where you actually think they are because i think it would be it would be impossible that the shifts and the pace that we both described and I think I should also add that I think that its impact on employee health, you know, and the inability to coach, train, develop, assess, um, you know, people's careers will have been dented by this. Mm. The, the same has to be true in government and maybe even more so because, um, you, you know, the front line of the frontline pressure. So I think that, you know, there's never been a more important time to introduce employee health and well-being, you know, into the system today than there has has been before. And I think, you know, if there's one word that probably we've used more in the last year than ever before, it's the word caring. There's never been in the business lexicon before, but now it is. You have to care for your colleagues you have to com com compare and understand the environment that they live in so i think that um almost certainly maybe more so you know these trends and challenges are apparent in government as they are everywhere else and we will not be the same when we come out of this and everybody's able to come back this will be a different organization it will operate differently It'll be differently configured, you know, and I think it has to be true in government too. Dame Karen? Um, just continuing on the same theme, really, but perhaps if I can make just say a slightly extended point. Um, I, I think that the private sector, British companies, for too long talked about and thought in terms of human capital. We even use the phrase term human capital rather than people. Uh, and um, the link between motivated, engaged employees and productivity was not understood. 
and I don't think it was even believed to be there, um, hence human capital. Uh, and what has changed, I think, over the last few years, but accelerated at extraordinary pace through the pandemic, is the recognition that that is wrong. Um, that actually motivated, engaged people in your organization enhance productivity, they uphold your standards, um, they, um, they, they enable you to succeed, they help you avoid mistakes, um, and they are fundamentally um, the responsibility of you as a leader. Uh, and um, I, I, um, I, I've worked in the public sector and the private sector. Um, I suspect that the private sector is a little bit further along this road than the public sector, but, but I would guess that there are parts of the public sector that are doing this very well as well, because the experience is somewhat uh, shared. Um, and um, so if there was one thing which I would hope that we can all get out of this, public and private together, is that recognition that um, uh, employee engagement, bringing your people with you, listening uh, uh, as leaders um, is actually not just a nice to have, um, it's fundamental to success. And actually a compassionate organization is a more successful organization. Um, uh, and uh, if that is something that um, the private sector is a little bit further ahead on, which it might be, possibly there are some lessons to be learned from conversations between uh, the two, but that is the one uh, I would bring out uh, as well. And is there a possibility that you could get your ethics regulation wrong if it's too complex and codified? There are people who worry about undermining individual responsibility. What's your response to that? Well, I think that um, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think that um, I, I was on the board of Lloyds Bank when we were dealing with PPI. Uh, and one of the things that I was very struck by was it was the codification of everything and the incentives that all actually um, militated against uh, natural human ethical values on the front line and led to the wrong decisions. So uh, I think there was a lot to be said for returning responsibility to people uh, armed with the right values that they have um, brought with them, learned, been trained in, uh, and, and, and you get better outcomes uh, that way. But it may involve devolution of accountability uh, and actually fewer rules rather than the other way around. So Jonathan? This is a pendulum that has swung from my entire career. And, um, you know, I think that there's a time for rules and there's a time for decentralization and freedom. And I think, you know, nobody ever has the pendulum in the right place. And it's partly because, um, you know, we live in a very adaptive system and that there's a problem and a new set of rules that weren't there before are needed and people have to adapt to that. What I think, um, you know, Carolyn so beautifully said about um, about employee engagement is so important now. And I think that, um, you know, people have to understand what they do and why they do it and for whose, for whose benefit. So I think, um, you know, you do need a rules framework because sadly you do have to. Um, you know, monitor the periphery of what's acceptable and what isn't. Um, but I think this process of continuous engagement and, and helping people learn by seeing what, you know, what happens when you do the right thing um, uh, is, is, is so important because this country has got to come out of this crisis, outward looking, ambitious, and confident and not introspective, fearful, you know, and I, you, you know, that I think is going to be a challenge of leadership is to create the environment for future long-term success. And that's true for the government, it's true for us too. Thank you. Thank you. I'm aware that we are trespassing slightly on your time, but I would very much like to pass the bat on Briefly to Jeremy Wright for one other rather important area from our point of view. Jeremy. Yes, thank you. I, I will try and ask you uh, as quickly as I can. Uh, but the thrust of your evidence so far, both of you, has been that any gap there might be 
between the standards expected in the private sector and the standards expected in the public sector is probably much smaller than many people think that it is. But I want to just ask you about one specific area where public and private sector intersect, and that's private sector companies delivering public services. And just test this assumption in two ways, perhaps. The first is on the, the quality of selflessness. Uh, how, in your view, do the interests of shareholders match with the interests of the public when you're talking specifically about private companies delivering public services? Now, uh, you may well say to us, well, um, we've already explained that in the new world we live in, actually, there's very little difference between public service uh, values and the interests of shareholders because of what we are now expected by our customers to deliver. And if that's, if that's your view, feel free not to add to it. But one other area perhaps is transparency. And I wanted to ask you both if you have a view specifically for those companies that deliver public services, whether you believe that under the heading of transparency, the Freedom of Information Act should be applied more generally to those private companies. Perhaps, Sir Jonathan, if you'd like to start with that one. Well, I think, um, I think the gap is very narrow, um, as, you, as you say. And I think that there should be no difference between um, negotiating with any commercial customer and any, and any government. And it is true that um, no organization can prosper continuously over the long term is if it is not delivering value to its customers. And I think that, um, you know, those that, those that don't seek to operate fairly or try and take a short term, a short term profit, um, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't lead to a long term relationship. So I don't think anybody should fear under those circumstances, transparency. Nobody should fear that. And um, you know, I think that people will feel, I think, feel happier about it if, you know, it is clear under, you know, what the conditions of, of service you are. I would say that the government contracting rules are fiendishly complicated, fiendishly so, and partly influenced by um, European regulations. So I know that... Um, you know, I'm on the board of Genomics England, and when every time that we go to a contract, you know, half the people that you would want to contract don't because of the, because of the complexity. So I think that there is a you know back to basics approach that would be quite that would be quite helpful here. Understood. Thank you, and Dane Carolyn. I, I also. Uh agree that I think the principles of transparency uh, and um, selflessness, as I think I said at the beginning, is just a slightly overly strong phrased, I think, principle for the private sector as it stands. But the idea of having you know, public interest, public purpose at the root of your, uh, of your objectives as a contractor into the public, into the public sector, I, I have absolutely no problem with that, or indeed the transparency. Um, I, I think there have to be uh, there has to be some recognition of the need for commercial confidentiality, um, which I think has to be respected. But that's a that's a solvable problem. Um, the 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 uh, it, given the importance of transparency, I think generally in business now this isn't a an issue. Um, but 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 I, I would like to make perhaps if I may a sort of a broader point around a pu public service uh, public companies being um, private companies supplying the public sector which I was very struck by in my time at the uh, CBI, which is I think there is a real opportunity to, to reinvent the partnership between the two um, with a contracting relationship that is based on public objectives and not purely on price. I was very struck by how important the price lowest cost objective was in the contracting process. Um, I was also struck by the complexity that Jonathan uh, has mentioned, but I think more worrying for me in terms of the kind of things that we have been discussing here today is a contracting model that only uh, uh, values uh, lowest cost provision in a public sector environment when the objectives are so much broader than that. And why can't there be a framework that recognises the public contribution that this partnership together wants to make, yes, in a value for money way, but it isn't just purely about price. Because I do think 
that has driven some behaviors and created some challenges and some trade-offs that could have been avoidable. So that would be my broader point I'd make about that relationship. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed from me as well. So Dame Caroline, uh, Carolyn and Sir Jonathan, we are very grateful for your time and for the evidence which actually helps to, to widen the picture of what we're